exciting to be able to study out one of the books in the Bible. At this time, we're studying out the book of Joshua. So be turning on over there. And it's exciting to be able to look at an entire book because it, it, it drives you to study out and really put on your heart texts that you wouldn't ordinarily consider. And I think the couple of chapters that we're going to be looking at this morning are just such text. We're going to be starting off in chapter 6 at the very end. And the title today is simply entitled, Sin in the Camp. There are four points. Number one, God's word is for all time. Number two, God's anger against all Israel. Number three, God's presence when all are consecrated. And number four, God's revered when all remember. Amen, church? Last week, we had an exciting study about the conquering of the city of Jericho and how the walls were collapsed by the very hand of God. And in fact, they collapsed outwardly, providing a ramp for all the Israelites from every direction to just seize the city. And the great victory was won there at Jericho. Amen, guys? Well, now there's almost a footnote to this. And we read this in verse 26 of chapter 6. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. We know the time of the conquering of Jericho was around 1400 B.C. And at the time right here, I mean, Joshua lays a curse on that city. He says, if anyone tries to rebuild right here on this tell, on this mound, if he tries to lay the new foundations, it'll be at the cost of his firstborn son. If he tries to set up its gates, it'll be at the cost of his youngest son. And that was the word of God. Now, Let's go forward in history about 650 years to 1 Kings 16. In 1 Kings 16, we read these words in verse 34. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram. And he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. In Ahab's time, the word of God was rare. And we learn right here that Hiel did what Joshua said not to do. We understand from this scripture that God's word is eternal. We understand that God's word is for all time. God's word was true in 1400 B.C. It was true in this passage in about 750 B.C. It was true at the time of Christ, and it's true today in 2007. Are you with me right here? God's word is timeless, and we need to understand that its applications are timeless. You know, one of the things that uh, Hebrews says in verse, chapter 4, verse 11, is that the word of God is living and active. And, you know, whenever you read the Word of God, it just, I mean, it speaks to you. But sometimes to encourage other, we have to speak the Word of God to one another. Are you with me right here? Just to remind each other, hey, God's promises, God's Word is eternal. You know, it's really kind of been a challenging few weeks for our dear brother, Ron Harding. He takes care of all the uh, video equipment and everything. And... uh, you know, he's been so excited, done so much for us to be able to start the, the congregation here. And in the midst of all of this, when he was doing so much, his company is brought out by another company. And he goes to his boss, and he says, hey, how, how's it going to look for me? And his boss goes, listen, no problem, Ron. We, we got you covered. We're going to take care of you. Well, a few weeks later, he finds out that he loses his job. And there's, I mean, it's nothing quite as discouraging as that for a guy. And so he's sad, and we're talking on the phone, and I said, bro, you just got to remember, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will give you everything you need. Well, in the meantime, 
he goes on in, and since they were letting him go, they were severance him, so he had to go into the office, and he had to sign some papers. And the good thing about getting severance, if there is such a good thing, is you get a severance pay. So he was getting a couple months' worth of pay. So in that sense, he was kind of happy. So as he's sitting there, one of the bosses comes by as he's literally signing the severance thing. He says, hey, Ron, I've been looking for you. Remember when we promised you that job? It finally came through. Ron goes, well, I'm signing the severance paper right here. What, what should I do? And the guy goes, well, hold it, Ron. How long have you been working for the company? Well, for five years. He says, I'll tell you what. You go ahead and sign the severance paper, get your severance pay, come back in two weeks, and we'll give you that new job. Amen? You see, when you seek first the kingdom, God is going to give you everything you need. Are you with me right here? See, we've got to understand, God's word is for all time. How about how much have you been in the word of God this week? How much have you let God speak to you? That's what the word of God is for. Now, we get back to the book of Joshua. In Joshua 7, we read these words. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel. And he told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people have to go up against Ai. Send two, three thousand men to take it. And, and do not worry the people, for only a few men are there. Sounds a little overconfident. You know what I mean? So about three thousand men went up. But they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Wow. Here they were, sort of on the spiritual mountain of just seeing Jericho fall by the hand of God. And now they come to Ai, and Ai just simply means ruins. It was a small little city, probably backed up against a mountain. And as the spies saw, it wasn't really big. We know the total inhabitants of the city was about 12,000. Later on in chapter 8, it, it records that. So it's a small city compared to the thousands in the army of Israel. And the Israelites say, hey, this is going to be a breeze. The only problem is, is what we read in verse 1. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Now, what were the devoted things? We'll go back to chapter 6 in verse 18. This is God giving the charge through Joshua, to the people of God, the Israelites. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So in other words, when they conquered Jericho, all of the precious metals were to go to the Lord. But it says right here, the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And the Bible says that Achan took some of them. Now, it's kind of interesting. In the Hebrew, unfaithfully is actually the word to cover. And it's like uh, the idea of a garment covering your body or covering something to that effect. And so some of your translations read, the Israelites acted deceitfully, which is probably a little bit more accurate translation. The idea of covering up something so that no one would know. The idea of, in fact, of secret sin. And, of course, you know, with humans, we can keep secrets from each other, but the Lord knows everything. There's no such thing as secret sin before the Lord. Are you with me right here? And so the Bible says that Achan acted unfaithfully, deceitfully. He covered up what he had stolen, thinking no one, not even God, was going to notice. And interestingly, then we find, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel, not just against Achan, but against all of Israel. And so when they went out to fight this seemingly insignificant city, they were routed by a lesser army. And the Bible says that this, the people's hearts melted and became like water. They knew that something was desperately wrong. You know, that's something that we all feel spiritually. You know, when things are not going our way, we know something is wrong. Something is wrong. And that's because the hand of God is upon us. Are you with me right here? Let's look at what Joshua did. 
Verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. He knew something was really wrong, and he's praying to God. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their head. I mean, just such abject humiliation and sprinkling dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. I mean, here's Joshua, the mighty general of God. Remember, 103 years old. Amen. God told him to be strong and vigorous. And yet right now he has a defeat. And he's even questioning, was it worth it? You know, a lot of times when we have defeats in our Christian life, we start looking back. We say, was all of my sacrifice even worth it? And we start doubting even being a disciple. Are you with me? Let's go on. Verse 8. Oh, Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe our names from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are, you, what are you doing down on your face? Israel sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them at their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against the enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Wow. I mean, God lays it out right here, doesn't he? See, our second point is God's anger against all Israel. God's anger against all Israel. This is a very important concept, I think, for all of us to grab a hold of from the scriptures. We see right here, Joshua was just disheartened, sad, and doubting. The people's heart is mounting. The elders don't know what to do. They're just, they're just hurting. And God says, what the heck are you doing down on your knees? Stand up and do something about the situation. Israel has sinned. That is why my hand is against them. And God just lays it on out. Now, you know, this principle is very important. Because a lot of times we think that our sin is not going to affect anybody else. Number one, no one knows about it. And so we, we just totally block God out of our thinking and from our hearts. You know, this concept, though, is carried into the New Testament. That God wants a people that are fully devoted to him, with no exceptions. Amen? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and see if we can get an understanding of why God did this. In 1 Corinthians 5, In verse 1, we find that there's a very challenging time in the Corinthian church. We read in verse 1, Paul writing, he said, It's actually poured that there's sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that doesn't even occur among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you're proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? I mean, Paul gets right down to business. What the heck are you guys doing there in Corinth? You've got a situation where a man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you're proud of it. What does he mean by that? Well, the people in the church were saying, well, we're open-minded. You know, we, we don't want to pass judgment on anything. You know, it's, it's just his life. He's got to live his own way. And they were taking pride in that stand right there. And Paul's upset. Why? Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may have a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He says, man, if you let this sin stay in the church, any kind of sin, from immorality to lukewarmness, if you don't deal with it, it'll spread throughout the entire church. Now look what he says in verse 9. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. Amen. He says, well, that's how the world is. Amen, guys. But now I'm writing that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, or a drunkard, or a swindler. But does such a man do not even eat 
What business is of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Right here, Paul lays it out. He says, you guys have got to be concerned about the purity of the church. It is your responsibility. Every single member is responsible to make sure that the body of Christ is pure before our Savior. Amen, church? You see, right here, he's saying, guys, there's a standard. And the standard of the Old Testament is the standard of the New Testament. Jesus himself was one time asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is in the Old Testament, and that is in the New Testament. And that is the standard for Christ's church to be sold out, to have an unconditional passion and love for God. And he says, hey, if there's a a brother that's falling short of this standard, you've got to deal with that situation. Now, this just goes counterintuitive to what's going on in a lot of different denominational churches. A lot of people even say, oh, no, I can't judge anybody. You ever heard that? And then they'll even quote the scripture. They'll say, well, Jesus says that. Do not judge lest he be judged. Matthew chapter 7. But you know how we always teach you got to read the scriptures in context. The context of that scripture is simply this. He says, don't judge lest he be judged because the measure you use will be the measure used against you. He says, do not go up to your brother and say, hey, you've got a speck in your eye when you got a two by four hanging out of yours. You see, the scripture that Jesus was talking about there wasn't saying don't judge your brother. He says don't do it hypocritically. You see, the Bible says very clearly right now here, what business of mine to judge those outside the church? Well, those outside the church are lost. Are you not to judge those inside? We are to be our brother's keeper. Now, I think in the past, in our fellowship of churches, there's been too harsh of a judgment. There's been hypocritical judgment. But the thing to do is not to stop judging or holding people accountable. When we stop holding our brothers accountable, then what happens? A Corinthian church situation happens. And Paul says, if you don't deal with the sin in the camp, if you don't deal with the sin in the church, it's not just going to stay isolated with one person. It will slowly infect the whole body. And the whole body will become full of sin. And the whole body will become lukewarm. Are you with me right here? See, that's why in the congregation here, we hold one standard, the standard of Jesus, when someone is baptized. I mean, it was really awesome last week when Estella was baptized. Amen? And I always love it when we have a, a, a person from the Spanish ministry baptized because I think it, it's good for us to have to listen to them speak in their heart language of Spanish and then wait a few moments for it's translated then figure out what they're saying. Because sometimes we, we have a pretty arrogant attitude being English speakers Thinking that, well, everybody should speak English when the Spanish ministry believes that God's language is Spanish. <laughs> but, you know, when, when Estella came to body, it was no different than the week before that. When Angie was, Angelie was baptized, there is one standard for somebody being baptized. You have to be a sold-out disciple. You have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Today, when we had the four people place membership, that was awesome. Amen, guys? I mean, it, it was great seeing them, and they're all different backgrounds, all, all different races, and that's awesome. But there's just one standard. To place membership in the congregation, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You've got to be sold out. And then I don't know about you. I mean, it was, it was awesome seeing Mike Underhill up here in his restoration. You know, and coming back to God, there's only one way to come back. You've got to be sold out. You've got to love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we need to have a conviction. That's how God wants his church built. That every single person has the same commitments. And that we have a responsibility to help each other keep that commitment. Because let's just face it. uh, You know, not once sold out, always sold out. Sometimes you can bomb out the next day. You know what I'm talking about right here? And, And we've got to have a spirit of love. And being our brother's keeper, but that spirit of love is not one where we say, okay, your life is not my life. No, if you really love somebody, you're going to be involved in their life. Are you with me here? See, we have to get a conviction. What was God trying to do back at Joshua's time? He was trying to create a people, a holy people, 
that would be his very own and that there would be one standard. And so when Achan sinned, it was a sin against God and it caused God to be against all of Israel. Let's go back to Joshua if we could, please. Let's pick it up in verse 13. God says to Joshua, go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted among you, O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes will come forward man by man. He who is caught with devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belong to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. And, of course, what happens is Achan is chosen. And so he comes before Joshua in verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you've done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside of my tent with silver underneath. So Joshua sent messages, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in the tent with silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. I mean, right here, the Lord knew it was Achan. He isolates them on up, and it's pretty amazing. If you can just imagine, here's the old general coming on up, and he just looks at him, and he says, my son. I mean, you, I mean, you almost feel the pain that he has that one of his brothers has fallen. He says, my son, give glory to God. You need to confess what you've done. See, one of the great challenges, I think, to being a disciple is to remain transparent. To have a transparent life. One of the funny things is I I find that young Christians are relatively transparent. Because they're they're humble. They, they, They remember, hey, I was just a derelict two weeks ago when I got baptized. And I'm just bumbling around here in the kingdom. And, oh, yeah, I did this sin and that sin. It's a funny thing about how we get older in the Lord. We go, well, we're a little bit more guarded. And we then cloak it with, well, I'm wiser. I can handle my own sin. And besides, this brother has this problem. Or sometimes we go, well, he's a younger brother, and I don't want to hurt him confessing my sin to him. There are many tapes you can play about Satan. But the challenge is, I think, the older you get, because you realize how gross sin is, is the willingness to be transparent. Is to let other people in your life. Because, guys, the first step to falling away is you're not sharing your life. That's why in the Lord we need to ask tough questions. How's your purity, brother? How's it going with your roommate? How's your relationship with your wife? How's it going with the kids? How's the job? How are the finances? Bottom line, there is no area of our life off limits. We need to be our brother's keeper. Amen? And right here, it's kind of sad. The Bible says, Achan replies, it's true. I'm the one. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, remember, Joshua, when they were defeated at Ai... I mean, he's fallen down before the ark and just crying to God. The the Israelite elders are tossing dirt on their hair. I mean, they're just totally distraught. And here's this guy just being confronted with his sin that he knows has routed all of Israel. He goes, well, it's true what I've done. He says, uh, when I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and some gold, I coveted them and took them. Now, you've got to understand, Babylon was known at this time as having the most cranking cloth. And so the weaving of their cloth often had gold thread in it, silver thread in it. And without question, Achan goes, man, that is one cranking robe right there. I really like it. Now, you understand how Achan is. 
you've gone, so to speak, window shopping. Oh, ooh, I hear that dress calling me. I mean, it, it, is the, it is the weirdest thing. Sometimes when you don't even need something, you feel that pull. i got to buy that. Have you ever felt that? I mean, it is unbelievable, that pull. And the pull of that Babylonian robe. And he says, well, and you know, it's a little tough times here in the promised land. I better pick up a little silver, a little gold. Because, well, you know, it is tough. And the Bible says, I hid it underneath my tent. Now, look what happens. Verse 24. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remain to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since then. Now, Achor literally means trouble in Hebrew. And so what happened right here is the Lord commanded that he be stoned. Now, at first, it's kind of interesting right here. I was taken aback by passage, and, and, and it says that his sons and his daughters were likewise stoned. I said, why? Well, we know that, certainly we already know that our sin can affect all Israel. And right here we find very directly it affected his family, but, but why such punishment? Well, if you look at Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1, you will find that God says... If you know about someone else's sin and you remain silent, you are responsible. Now think about this. If you're living in the same tent, you're going to know what's hidden underneath it. They knew all along. Now they did not steal it most likely. They didn't steal that cranking robe. They didn't put the silver and gold in their pockets. But they knew it was there. And God says, because you know, because you've kept silent, you are held responsible for this sin. See, we need to get a conviction, church, that we cannot keep silent. If something is not right, we've got to speak up. It's a matter of truth. I think one thing that hurts a lot of churches are, are, are people that just keep silent. If you know something is not right, you've got to speak up. Or else you will be held responsible. And you too may be captured in that whole web of sin. You know, it's kind of interesting. Turn to Luke chapter 8. We, 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 we sometimes look with disdain on many of the situations in the Old Testament. We just kind of shake our heads. We just go, man, Achan, I can't believe that guy. So worldly. I can't believe it. I mean, going after that Babylonian robe and that gold and that silver. How can he do such a thing? You know, Jesus was a very clever teacher. A lot of times when he taught, he used parables. And the whole idea of the parable was he'd tell a seemingly everyday event and he made people think about where they're at spiritually because if you're not doing good spiritually, you don't like to think about where you're at. And so in one particular case, in Luke chapter 8, he tells the parable of the sower. He tells about this farmer that goes out to sow his seed. And back in those days, the farmer would go out and he'd have a bag of seed on one side, a bag of seed on the other. And he would just literally put his one hand in one bag and cast the seed on out. It would fall wherever. Then he'd walk a few more steps, take his other hand and cast the seed all out. And so Jesus hey. Some of the seed fell along the path, and it didn't even penetrate the path. Some of the seed fell on rocky soil, and yes, it grew for a while, but then when the scorching sun came, because it had no root, it withered. He says, some of the seed fell on some soil, and it grew. But then some thorns and thistles got it and ch choked the life out of it. And then the fourth seed fell on good soil, and it produced a crop 30, 60, and 100 fold. Well, Jesus explains the parable in Luke chapter 8, and he says in verse 12, the seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. 
Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word of God, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And the church said, See, right here, he lays it out. He says, there are some people that just hear the word of God, have nothing to do with it. He says, but there are some people when persecution comes, their roots are not deep. When the heat comes, they back off. You know, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus was controversial. And I don't believe that you can be Jesus' church unless you teach the things of Jesus. And when you teach the things of Jesus, you are going to be controversial. Are you with me right here? And we need to get used. Hey, there are going to be some things said about you if you become a sold-out disciple. There are going to be half-truths. There's going to be character assassination. And you're going to have to understand, that's the path that Jesus had to take because our lives are a threat to the world. He says, but you better understand, when the heat comes, you better have your roots down deep so you can handle that heat. Are you with me here, church? But I think the challenge to most of us it's the third soil. It says, this is the place where the seed fell, and it, and it grew. It grew, but the thorns came and choked the life out. Well, how did, how did it choke the life out? Well, the worries of this life. Riches and pleasures. And the Bible says, they do not mature. See, a lot of people think, I've been around the kingdom five years, ten years, twenty years. And I'm a mature person. No, no, no. You're just an aged disciple. You're not a mature disciple. A mature disciple, by reference right here, is one that's producing fruit. All you are is an aging disciple. You're not mature. A mature disciple, according to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, is one who teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, you've got to ask yourself long and hard. Am I like Achan? Do I have the sin of greed? Do I have the sin of materialism? Has this choked the spiritual life out of me to the point that I'm no longer involved in people's lives and helping them come to Jesus Christ? These are some serious, serious questions that we've got to ask ourselves. Amen, church? You know, uh, I was blessed on Friday night, uh, Sal and Patricia. Where's Sal and Patricia at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They invited me to come and see their two little girls perform a dance. They, they, they're, they're elementary schools doing different things. And Priscilla and Daniela were, were there. And so I was blessed to be able to come and, and, and be with them and, and Sal's parents as well. And, you know, it was, it was, it was amazing. I, I sat there and I just remembered back when my kids were in elementary school. And I go, you know, that wasn't that long ago. And then... And then one of the, they had several classes, and, and, and they were supposed to do these kind of choreographed things. And they had all these modern type songs. But one of the songs that they had was Shake Your Booty. <laughs> so you have these little girls up on stage, you know, shaking their, you know. And I, and I looked at that and I said, you know something? <clears throat> these little kids are so innocent right now. And yet already the world is seeping in through a very interesting means, through music. And a worldliness, a mindset is coming into them and already invading their souls. See, God wants us to be his children, pure. And the most amazing thing about being a disciple is, yes, when we're baptized, we get all of our sins forgiven. You remember when you got baptized? Do you remember how awesome it felt when you came out of that water? I was baptized at 1.30 in the morning when I was 17 years old. There were only four people there. It wasn't a real big thing. But God was there. And I remember how I came out of the water. I said, man, all of my sins are forgiven. And the sad thing is a lot of Christians... Don't understand that this is the condition 
in mind and heart that God wants us to feel all the time. That, that, that squeaky clean where you just, this is awesome. That sense of purity that we see in little children. And what we've got to do as a church is we've got to say, hold it. We've got to call out sin in our own lives first. Amen, guys. Be transparent. We've got to be willing to love each other enough to call out sin in each other's life. But at the end of the day, then once we've called it out and repented, we need to feel like we've just come out of the waters of baptism. That is how awesome God wants us to feel because that's our actual state before him. Does that fire you on up? Amen. See, the Bible teaches in 1 John chapter 1 that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us as long as we're walking in the light. Yes, God's presence will be with us when we are all consecrated. Let's go to our last point. God's revered when all remember. Let's go to Joshua chapter 8. There's some cool things here. We read this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. Drop down to verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out towards Ai the javelin that's in your hand, for into your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out his javelin towards Ai. As soon as he did this, the men in the ambush rose quickly from their position and rushed forward. They entered the city and captured it and quickly set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising into the sky. But they had no chance to escape in any direction, for the Israelites who had been fleeing towards the desert had turned back against their pursuers. For when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke was going up from the city, they turned around and attacked the men of Ai. The men of the ambush also came out of the city against them, so that they were caught in the middle with the Israelites on both sides. Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivor nor fugitives. God was victorious that day. Amen, guys? You see, when we are restored, to God, individually but collectively as people, God is going to make his people victorious. God's church will be victorious when we are calling each other to be pure before the Lord. Are you with me here, church? Now, what's very interesting is what happens at the very end of this account. If you drop down to verse 30, it's an amazing passage that sometimes goes unnoticed by the hurried churchmen. Verse 30. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what was written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. You know, very similar to the circumcision. God didn't want something that was, quote, made by man to be able to do something of God. On it, they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacred fellowship offerings. There in the presence, the Israelites, Joshua copied on the stones the law of Moses, which he had written. Now, you need to understand that this is an amazing passage. A lot of scholars say, well, I don't know if this really happened. That's a bunch of baloney. Whatever's in the Bible happened. Are you with me right here? What amazes the scholars is, is going to Mount Ebal would be about 20 miles away from where Ai was at. And remember now, the promised land was not totally conquered at this point, and therefore, to some degree, there'd be vulnerability. But Joshua knew we need to go to Mount Ebal. And we've had an incredible victory there at Jericho. Now God has given us a victory at Ai, but we need to remember something. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 27. One of the last things that Moses commands the people before he's asked to go up on Mount Nebo and die, is that they need to go to Mount Ebal. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, keep all the commandments I give you today. When you have crossed the Jordan into the land your God is giving you, set up some large stones and coat them with plaster. Write on them all the words of the law that you have crossed over to enter the land the Lord your God has given you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. 
And when you've crossed over the Jordan, set up these stones on Mount Ebal as I commanded you today and coat them with plaster. Build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool upon them. Build the altar of the Lord your God with field stones and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Sacrifice fellowship offerings there, eating them and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord your God. And you shall write very clearly all the words of the law on these stones that you've set up. Then Moses and the priests who were Levites said to the Israelites, Be silent, O Israel, and listen. You have now become the people of the Lord your God. Obey the Lord your God and follow his commands and decrees that I give you today. On the same day, Moses commanded the people, When you've crossed the Jordan, these tribes shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these tribes shall stand on Mount Ebal to pronounce the curses, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebedon, Dan, and Natali. The Levites shall recite to all the people of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed is the man who carved an image or cast an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of a craftsman's hand, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, and the church said, Amen. Wow, can you imagine this? Joshua remembers the words of Moses. He says, We need to go back and reconfirm the covenant of the law. God had already appointed the place to go. This was not by chance. Mount Ebal, and Elaine and I have been there, is a mountain that, that rises over a thousand feet from ground level. It's on the north side of a valley. Mount Gerizim is on the south side. It's a little bit smaller. Ebal literally means bald or rocky. And the Bible says that Moses, of course through the Spirit of God, wanted half of the Israelites, six of the tribes, to gather on Mount Ebal, the rocky, bald mountain. And on that side of the mountain, they were to pronounce the curses of the law. And they were indeed to build the altar right there. Then the other half of the tribe of Israel would gather on Mount Gerizim. And they would pronounce the blessings of all the law that Moses wrote. Now that's a long ceremony, is it not? And there they were to record on stones covered over with plaster written the entire law on out. Why? So the people would not forget. Can you imagine this? Thousands are gathered on Mount Ebal. Thousands are gathered on Mount Gerizim. And then the Levites began to read the curses. And it says, Cursed is the man who has carved an image or cast an idol. And then everybody on Mount Ebal goes, Amen! And you just hear it through the valley, Amen, 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 Amen. And all the guys on Jerusalem are going, I'm not going to do that. And then they read again, Cursed is the man who dishonors his father and mother! And everybody on Ebal goes, Amen! And then after going through all the curses, come the blessings of God. And all the people on Jerusalem go, Amen! That day will never be forgotten. Because you see, that's what worship is all about. It's coming before Jehovah God in awe and reverence. Now, it says right here in verse 7, They were eating together and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. Hey, you know, being sold out to God is awesome. It's great. You know, it's those people that have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They're the miserable ones. You know, you're you're a lot happier if you're just flat all in the world or you're flat all in the church. The most miserable people are the ones that are straddling it. You see in the picture of the postcard, you have the donkey over that fence, you know. Darn if you do, darn if you don't. That's how a lot of people feel. You know, we, we need to get a conviction. I mean, there's just so much joy. When you're sold out to God. But if you got part of yourself in the world, there's not joy. It's struggle. You're miserable. You're unhappy. And right here, this service on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim was to remind the people of the covenant. The covenant of God. Now, later on, Moses concludes these thoughts, and it's very interesting, in chapter 30. It says in verse 1, when all these blessings and curses I've set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, 
wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you've been banished to the most distant land under heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Is that awesome? God knew at different periods of history his people would fall into such sin and different than the Israelites did with Achan. They would not repent. God was angry with Israel and he, in his anger, scattered his people. But God says, listen, I'm not giving up on you. I'm just disciplining you. Because when you get scattered enough, you'll, man, I really need the Lord. I really need the Lord. And then the Bible says that God will bring us all back together. No matter how far you got out there in your life, no matter how far you got out there doctrinally, God says, I'm coming to get you when you call my name. And it's God that brings us together. I think that's what makes this church special. A lot of us have fought for our relationship with God. It's been tough. We've been disciplined by the hand of God. And God is gathering us back. There's something special that's happening. And God is pulling us together. Now, look the final charge. Verse 11, chapter 30. Now, what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. Okay. Everything we've laid out here, guys, you can do. Oh, bro, you don't know my life. No, no, no. You can do it. You may need some help. You may need some encouragement. Say, yeah, I don't know the Bible. Just ask the person that brought you. Hey, can you study the Bible with me? I want what I see. Nothing we've talked about today is too difficult. You can do it. Read on. Verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Man. You know, there are some that have been Christians for 5, 10, 15 years. And and they are like Joshua going, oh man, why did we even do it? Has it been worth it? All this And yet God is saying, listen, come back to me. Come back to me with all of your heart and all of your soul. And I will bless you beyond anything. But you got to choose life. you got to make a decision. You know, it's very amazing. Different than Mike that understood he fully fell away from the Lord. We've had several brothers and sisters restored who, when we first got with them, they thought they were doing great spiritually. We got with one particular sister this week. Lena, myself, and she says, you know, the great thing ever since I left the church is I've never left God. Yeah, I've been living with this guy for several years, but I've never left God. That's how deceived people are. They're not living the life of a disciple. But, I, but I'm with God. I read my Bible every now and then. No, you need to understand. You have left God. And there needs to be a restoration. That standard, when people are brought together under that standard, will be powerful. You know, one of the greatest things that I've ever been able to be a part of is what happened about four years ago in Portland, Oregon. The Portland church at one time was a glorious church. They had about 275, 300 members, about four or 500 on Sundays. And at one time was incredible. And then sin and rebellion hit the church. It dissipated. And by the time Elena and I were asked to, to go serve there, and we feel very, very honored to have been asked, our first midweek, 
we set up 25 chairs. That was all that was left. And one of the things that I, I, I knew is I, I've got to go out after these people. So with the 25 people there, as well as a lot of the members that left, I went out after them. And I asked three questions. I said, what was awesome about the Portland Church? Because a lot of people had forgotten what was awesome, like their salvation. <laughs> Secondly, I said, well, what need to change? They had lots of ideas about that one. And thirdly, I said, well, what would you like to have taught? And they had different ideas. Very quickly and soon on, I understood something. The people saw the sins of the leaders so clearly. There were, they saw the leaders to be arrogant, and they were. There was harshness, and there was. There was injustice and favoritism, and it's true. But the thing that I, I just, I sat back, they were totally oblivious to their own sin of anger and bitterness and rage and hate. And I, I early on, and Forty areas are here and others can testify. Early on, I said, guys, we're going to go nowhere unless we all see our sin and come before the Lord and ask forgiveness. And so I said, here's what we're going to do. We started the ministry there in mid-July. And I said, come August 13th, we are going to have an evening of atonement. And everybody goes, oh, that sounds awesome. Evening of atonement. What's that? I said, well, we haven't made it up yet, but it's going to be good. As time went on, I said, you know what we need to do? We just need to get back as many people as possible. And that night, people just need to individually come before the Lord and before the church and just confess their sins. Well, I just taught about how not only do we need to be transparent, much like I talked about today, but I also talked about that all the people that were hurt said, listen, you know, you believe that baptism is for salvation. Amen. Well, so is forgiveness. If you are unwilling to forgive, that's like never being baptized. It's just as essential part of salvation as repentance and baptism. And that was the stage that was set. And so I'll never forget the night before, our, or actually two nights before the evening of atonement, which was a Wednesday night church service, I get a call from this brother named Tony Antelon. Tony goes, bro, I need to talk to you. Well, Tony had not talked to me hardly at all. He says, we need to talk tomorrow at Starbucks. I go, amen. So we get together and... and Sounded really gruff and upset, but he goes, bro, I've been thinking, I'm so mad. I'm so upset about all that's happened in the church. I'm so mad at so many people. I think, you know, tomorrow night at the evening atonement, I need to go first, because if people see me repent, it'll be downhill for everybody else. I said, that's awesome, Tony. That's awesome. I'm literally walking away from that appointment. I get a phone call from a guy named Jeremy, who was in the ministry there. He says, bro, I, I know I'm one of the leaders, and the leaders need to lead the way, and I know... I need to confess my sin, and, and I want to be first tomorrow. I said, that's just not possible, Jeremy. He says, why? I said, Tony's going first. He says, can I be second? I said, that'll be great. <laughs> we came together that Wednesday night. Now, mind you, we, we'd only had small groups at this point. We had well over 100 people there. And I laid it out from the scriptures, what we're going to do. And Tony got up there. And, you know, Tony at that time is about 40 years old, 45. And he gets up there, and he, he, he looks so gruff and hard, and then all of a sudden he starts crying. <laughs> <laughs> and he just breaks down and says, I'm so sorry to the Lord. I'm so sorry to you. And I just see everybody else losing it out there. Then Jeremy gets on up here, you know, Mr. Polished Preacher and everything. He starts crying about all of his sin. And it was amazing, guys. All of a sudden, people started getting up out of their chairs and wanting to stand in line. And the line got longer and longer. People get up, and then they start being specific. Bob, I'm so sorry about my sin. I didn't mean, I, well, I did. I'm sorry. And it just got specific. It was incredible. This went on for two and a half hours, and still there was a line right there. And I had to stop at that point. I said, guys, you know, if we don't stop it, it's, it's midweek, it's Wednesday night, it's 10 o'clock, and the teachers in Kids' Kingdom are going to get bitter towards all of us if we don't rescue those kids, if you know what I'm talking about. But, you know, that night I knew something special had happened. The people of God had been reborn. Because, you see, when we individually go before God and then collectively agree as a group that we want to be the holy people of God, God can do anything with us. It was amazing. Just a few weeks later, we saw baptisms again. And see, the amazing thing, for, for years in our movement, we used to see hundreds and thousands of baptisms. We'd almost yawn our way through them. Oh, they had 500 this week over there. 
And then when all the baptism stopped, everybody knew the hand of God was against us. And so when the first baptisms came, we knew it was God blessing our repentance. And now we appreciate it, each baptism. The first couple are Omar and Selena that are in the Spanish ministry. And with each baptism, we knew that God was with us. And into the church came a reverence, a sense of awe that our God is with us again. You see, so many of us, as we grow old, get spiritual amnesia or spiritual Alzheimer's. And we forget how good the Lord has been to us. And one of the great things that I learned from the Portland church is when you're doing lousy spiritually, you become very man-focused. You're worried about what people think of you. You see all of everybody's faults. But when you're doing great spiritually, you just think about the Lord and you think about God's perspective. And you have a heart that's willing to do anything. You know, I really believe that God is moving in our congregation here. I love our name, City of Angels Church. That's awesome. As long as they're just the good angels with us. Amen, guys. <laughs> but I really want to beg you this morning. Whatever garbage has come into your life, whatever secret sin, that you confess it, that you deal with it, God will forgive. And then as a church, we'll come together. The Spirit will be with us. The Jerichos, their walls will fall. The AIs will be conquered. And so will the entire promised land and the world evangelized in our generation. Thanks and God bless.